And here is Chris now. He's 20 years older, but he's so much fitter. He's not on any medication. We put his diabetes into remission seven years ago. His blood pressure is cured. His fatty liver is gone. He's a well man. Hey guys, this is a superb talk from Dr. David Unwin and Jen Unwin, just 20 minutes long, and it goes through how they put diabetes type 2 into remission. Incredible success over the past decade or so. So send it to anyone you know who has type 2 diabetes, you know, cardiovascular problems, any of the modern chronic diseases, because the solution is pretty much the same, and it's the magic of eating real food. So enjoy. In fact, we're going to start with Jen and then you'll have me. So here's Jen. Yeah, so thanks so much for the introduction. As you say, I'm a, a clinical health psychologist by background, uh, worked in the NHS a long time. But then David and I started working together to help people change their chronic health conditions, mostly to diabetes. And of course, it's about changing lifestyles. So that involves quite a lot of psychology. <laughs> So it's been a great partnership in, in all ways, <laughs> the psychology and the medical one. And you'll hear from me a little bit more at the end, uh, Brendan, uh, about the book. So I'll talk a bit more about that at the end. And uh, so I'm Dr. David Unwin, a GP from north of Liverpool. I've looked after the same population since 1986. And we'll be talking about the differences of that improving diet has made to my entire population that I care for. As well as being a GP, uh, we have produced all our own meat or most of our own meat for 20 years. So I hope you can see my slides now. And there's a few of our sheep. We eat about two sheep a year, probably one pig or two pigs a year and a cow on the whole. So we produce a lot, uh, we eat a lot of meat. Oh, and we produce all our own eggs. And some veg. And some veg. <laughs> we live on a small holding. Uh, our son is just about to open a butcher shop in Kendall. So uh, we're both healthcare professionals, but we're both very interested in food. We produce our own food. We're very interested in how the quality of food impacts on health. So it's our two big interests, eating and health. And this talk, I hope, will bring them together. So first of all, this is one of my patients. This is Chris. He is 40 years old. He's got type 2 diabetes with poor control. I've got him in all the drugs I can think of for type 2 diabetes. He's got high blood pressure. He's got fatty liver disease and He's a worried man. He weighs nearly 20 stone. And my point really is it doesn't matter how many drugs I give Chris, he's not enjoying life. He's not a well man. And I think I was fooled for years thinking that prescribing drugs was the only way to help people and that diet wouldn't make a difference. When really the drugs, the results we get with drugs are or can be very disappointing because it doesn't really cure them because we haven't actually dealt with the cause of why Chris weighs 20 stone, has diabetes, hypertension, and high blood pressure. And the worry is that people like Chris are much more common now than they were in 1986. So in 1986, in my practice, we had 57 people with type two diabetes. We've now got about 500. So it's the same population um, people aren't moving around very much here. And there's an epidemic of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and fatty liver. And I'm sure that the same goes for Ireland as well. Um, and really, the answer cannot be to give drugs to the entire population. And here is Chris now. He's 20 years older, but he's so much fitter. So you see him there. He's not on any medication. We put his diabetes into remission seven years ago. His blood pressure is cured. His fatty liver is gone. He's a well man. Not need, he's not a patient in any way. He's fit, active, and enjoying life. And he was one of the very first people that Jen and I uh, cured. And uh, so he was one, but actually now, 
we've got 97 people who we've replicated. So we've done the same thing 97 times. It says 95, but we've done two more since I did this slide. And we're getting better and better at reversing chronic disease because we're thinking about the true cause and the true cause is dietary. And this is just to say that it can make financial sense. So this is the uh, money that each of the 19 GP practices locally spend on type two diabetes. And you'll see that my practice, the Norwood practice, spends so much less than anybody else. We actually save 58,000 pounds per year on drugs for diabetes alone. So it can actually be, make financial sense to help people have better health because you save a fortune on the drug budget. And particularly um, for countries around the world that don't have an NHS like the UK, achieving good health without paying for drugs can be very interesting. So um, I'm going to talk to you about the role of sugar and starchy carbs in how your liver works, the role of triglyceride, which is a cholesterol-like thing in your blood, why it is that people get a big belly and why they're hungry, and also how it is that people develop type two diabetes. And uh, partly to illustrate it, this is one of my pigs here. Every now and then I, I get a pig and I see how big I can grow it, make a sausage pig. So this is one of my sausage pigs. And any of you who have kept pigs will know a thing or two about fattening pigs. And you do need carbohydrate to fatten pigs. It's not just about protein. And um, they fatten very well on grain. The other thing is, if you give uh, either pigs or uh, cows too much grain, some of the farmers there will know they get a white liver that's difficult to sell. And that liver is similar to the foie gras liver. You know, when they force geese in France to have carbohydrate, put a funnel down, they grow this big liver that's white and it's white because it's full of fat. And so that's a farming link for carbohydrate, starch and fatty liver. But I'm gonna go over it in more detail for you all. I want you to think about the hormone insulin. So insulin is a hormone, it's produced by the pancreas gland. And insulin has a very special job to do because your body knows that a high blood sugar is dangerous. And in fact, a high blood sugar over time ages your arteries. And it's a high blood sugar that causes heart attacks and strokes. So insulin is there to get the sugar out of the bloodstream. But the question is, where does insulin put that sugar? So partly insulin pushes sugar into your muscle cells for energy. But if you continue to eat more biscuits and cakes and bread than you need for energy, that builds up sugar in your bloodstream that has to be got rid of. And insulin then pushes that same sugar into your liver cells. And the liver turns the sugar to fat. And that is why a quarter of everybody in the developed world has a fatty liver. This is another epidemic, a fatty liver. And a fatty liver is an unhealthy liver. Also, the extra sugar gets pushed into your belly fat. And that is why everybody's developing middle age spread now. They're getting huge bellies and it's because the sugar is being pushed out of the bloodstream into the belly fat. And that explains the beer belly that is so common because beer is full of carbohydrate and sugar and it gets pushed into your belly. So that's the link between sugar, insulin, a big belly and fatty liver. But I haven't explained why it is that so many people now have type two diabetes. So as I just explained, 
As you continue to eat more bread or potatoes, any starchy things that turn into sugar, the liver is filling with fat. And one of the things that a fatty liver does, it interferes with the good work of insulin. So your insulin doesn't work as well. You become insulin resistant and the blood sugars start to climb and do their damage. And this is part of diabetes. But unfortunately, that same process of fatty infiltration is going on in your pancreas, the very organ responsible for producing the insulin your lives depend upon. And you struggle to produce enough insulin. So these th two things together is how we have an epidemic of type two diabetes. It can't be genetic. It can't be genetic because my population have seen an epidemic in 30 years. So the genes haven't changed in 30 years. It's the diet that's changed in 30 years. Our grandparents' generation, diabetes was very rare, very rare. And now it's common. And I've got people as, eight, as young as 10 years old with diabetes. And what is their future? And uh, we need to uh, do something quickly because the health effects of diabetes are so serious. And here's another thing. So why is, why is a fat person hungry? Because actually they've got somebody that weighs 20 stone has got two to three months supply of energy stored in their belly. So why are they hungry? I know that I was hungry every single day, all day, until I was 55 years old. I was always thinking about the next meal. And insulin is partly responsible for hunger because insulin has an imperative to get rid of blood sugar. So if you carry on eating Mars bars and biscuits and cakes through the day, you have insulin there all the time. And insulin has another trick up its sleeve. It stops you from being able to burn your own fat. So that even though you're full of fat reserves, you can't access them, you can't burn fat. So I've been on a very low carbohydrate diet now for eight years. So that's called nutritional ketosis. So I'm a fat burner. So my belly is long since gone um, because I can burn fat. It also means I can fast if I need. If I, don't, if I miss a meal, it doesn't matter. Today I've only eaten one meal and it's all I shall eat. It doesn't matter because I can burn fat. And that's the advantage of a very low carbohydrate diet, which is also called the keto diet, because you're able to burn fat and you're not as hungry. And that's what my patients tell me. Every single surgery I ever do, uh, I'm told, isn't it funny, I'm not hungry. So three people this afternoon, I was doing a surgery, three people said, I've been so surprised not to be hungry on a low carb diet. So here's my model of type two diabetes. Basically, with type two diabetes, we're trying to get control of the blood sugar. And so where does the blood sugar come from? It's a balance between sugar in, which is table sugar, but also rice, potatoes and cereals, all the things that digest down into sugar and sugar out. Things that get sugar out, exercise gets sugar out. The drugs we use for type two diabetes like insulin also get sugar out. But as I've explained, insulin pushes that sugar into your belly, making you fatter. So really, it makes so much more sense to turn the tap of sugar off. Don't eat what you can't metabolize. Don't eat what is a metabolic poison. If you have type 2 diabetes, you're struggling to metabolize sugar. So you best not eat it. And that's the message I share with my patients. It seems a bit blunt. But really, it's better that I'm plain speaking and they understand rather than we're chopping legs off. And that is what we are doing. I heard from Tom Watson, the deputy leader of the Labour Party the other day, and he said, wasn't it, how many amputations a week was it? About 125. I think it was 125 feet and legs are being chopped off every week in the UK due to diabetes. So it's so much better to improve people's diet before we start amputating bits. So I ask patients, you know, I explain, 
that you, you want to avoid high blood sugar. So where do you think sugar comes from in your diet? And each of us should think, I want, you know, where does the sugar come from in my diet? And am I having too much? So loads of people know to cut out table sugar if they're diabetic. We used to call it sugar diabetes as I, when I was a younger doctor as a, a hint that you should avoid sugar. But I think what we often, often forget is the starch sugar too. In fact, starch is concentrated sugar. So starch is all the um, things in cereals. So this is maize, corn, wheat, rice, all of these things. Potatoes, that's starch. And starch is glucose molecules holding hands. And when you digest starchy foods very quickly, um, that sugar is released into your bloodstream. And that's why bread is sugar and why cornflakes is sugar. These are one of my teaspoon of sugar equivalent charts. And we're looking here at the effect, approximate effect on your blood sugar of these various foods in terms of teaspoons of sugar. So that a bowl of rice, 150 grams of boiled rice is approximately equivalent to 10 teaspoons of sugar on your blood sugar. A bowl of boiled potato, a small bowl, 150 grams, is about nine teaspoons of sugar. So if you have type two diabetes, rice and boiled potatoes are mad things to eat because you're just giving yourself a sugar burden you can't deal with. And then you'll need more and more drugs. And the same goes for chips, uh, spaghetti, and so on. Um, even a single slice of whole grain bread, a small slice of bread is the same as three teaspoons of sugar. So if you think about the average diet of so many people with breakfast cereals, snacks, bread, pizza, it's sugar with your sugar with your sugar. And it's no wonder that people are getting fat and people are developing type two diabetes. And if I feed my pigs on bread, potatoes, all of the things on this list, I'll get a nice fat sausage pig. And that's, I think, what's happening to so many of my patients. The diet is making them fat. If you're interested in these charts, the charity, the Public Health Collaboration, has there are seven of these charts to help you understand diet. And they're all there free of charge. If you just Google sugar, PHC, and unwin. And that's our uh, Matt Hancock the Secretary of State for Health in the UK, and he wants, he wants to help me, so he had his photo taken with my teaspoon of sugar equivalents, so we're making some progress. Mm -hmm. This is the, the diet that I've been using for nine years now at Norwood Avenue. And basically, it's a low-carb diet, so we're saying replace the white stuff, like potatoes, like rice, um, with green stuff, turn the white stuff green and increase the protein so that um, I'm really encouraging people to eat eggs. There's been so much nonsense about eggs. Eat as many eggs as you like, and my patients do, and their lipid profiles are fine. The sheep are there because I'm wanting people to eat um, more lamb particularly, and, and pasture-raised beef is also excellent. So increase the protein, re reduce the carbs, increase the protein, and use healthy fats. And by healthy fats, I do mean pure Irish butter, because it is grass-fed, so it's healthy. So here's a doctor advocating eggs, butter, and meat. And I've got the, the statistics, as you'll see soon, to see what happened to my patients when I did that. Um, I'm sure Iva will be finding you many of these studies, uh, but in the early days, I faced a lot of criticism um, because uh, it was assumed my patients would come to harm. I got hate mail, I was shouted at, um, and yet there are plenty of studies showing um, that, uh, for instance, here we have dairy consumption is associated with improvements in blood pressure and uh, diabetes in 147,000 people that were looked at in 21 countries. And it says here, 
that higher intake of whole fat, but, no low, but not low fat dairy was associated with a lower prevalence of the metabolic syndrome and also hypertension and diabetes. So I'm encouraging my patients not to have skim milk, but to have full fat milk and cream and butter. And the results, as you're going to see, are astonishing. Here's another one of my patients. This is Roy, a typical uh, patient of mine and very fond of Roy. I've known him for decades. He came to me. Uh, here he is when he came, actually, although he, he wasn't wearing a bow tie when he came. But um, you can see he's a very heavy man. He had very high blood pressure and type 2 diabetes. After a year, this is him now. He's got rid of his belly, as you see. His diabetes is gone, he's on no medication, his blood pressure is improved, and he's off all his blood pressure medication. So that's another case. The thing with, with Roy, again, he's not a patient. He doesn't need doctors now, and he understands that he's in charge, that diet can make all the difference in the world, and he's so proud of what he's achieved. So he's another one of the 97 patients we've done. I think one of the most important things, and this is what Jen has taught me, is the value of hope. So that if you see diabetes as a curse and something that you will get chronically worse and worse and then die, it's pretty depressing. Uh, but if we can help people understand that if they eat better and cut out the sugar and the starch out of their diet, they can actually be in much better health. And Roy is in much better health now. He's joined a gym. He's full of life, has a lot more energy. If people can have hope of better health, it's a better way to motivate them. And then the second thing is helping people understand diet and physiology so that they, the advice they get is in a framework that they understand why it is that sugar is so bad for you. These are the results um, for uh, my cohort of the people with type two diabetes. There's 187 of them there. They've improved their hemoglobin A1C, which is how sugary the diet is, by 30%. Look at the cholesterol, the HDL, the cholesterol ratio and the triglycerides. They're all improving. The triglyceride, a cholesterol-like fat in the blood, improves by 30%. And this is despite a diet full of butter, full fat dairy, cheese, and eggs. The opposite of what I'd expected. And the weight improves significantly, and then so does the blood pressure, and the gamma GT is liver function. So this is not just about type two diabetes. Significant improvements in lipid profiles, blood pressure, weight, and liver function. And in fact, because I'm talking to farmers, I found a, a study here where they substituted lean red meat with, car sorry, the other way around, they substituted carbohydrate with lean red meat and improved the blood pressure. So these people stopped eating bread and started eating more steak and they got significant improvements in their blood pressure. That should be music to your ears. And now I'm going to hand over, we're nearly finished, this is Jen, who obviously wants you to buy her book, so she's going to tell you about it. <laughs> a book, a book uh, all of the profits of which go to the public health collaboration that David was mentioning, where his sugar infographics are stored, so not for personal profit. Um, I wrote this book because the advice is pretty simple. As David says, it's a simple message. Cut down your sugars and carbohydrates. Increase your proteins and fats. Um, but a lot of people struggle uh, to do that. Uh, it's quite hard in our culture. We're now in a very sort of carbocentric, sugar-centric uh, environment the whole time. There's, there's junk food and snack foods everywhere you go. And for every celebration, it seems we've gone completely mad for hard carbohydrate. And part of the reason for that is that um, sugar um, acts in a, an addictive way in the brain, in a very similar way to alcohol and um and other drugs and nicotine it, it, it if you if you look at the brain of a sugar addict it looks just like uh the brain of a drug addict in terms of the changes that you see so for a significant proportion of us 
uh, it's it's a real struggle to follow David's advice and we've definitely seen that in, in the patients and I, I saw it in myself. So I wanted to write a simple book which helps to explain the psychological side of it, if you like, and and how people can slowly move towards this real food uh, lifestyle in a very sustainable way so that they're not, um, we've had lots of patients who've done really well, but then slip back rather spectacularly and then have to sort of start all over again. So um, how to make it sustainable really is the, the point of the book. So it's, it's, a, it's a book um, with the science sort of simply explained um, for people who are struggling to implement the advice. I mean, some people just go ahead and get it straight away. Um, other people do, do struggle significantly. So this is a book for them, for the sugar addicts of the world. So I hope yeah. that will be useful for some of you or pe maybe people that you know. Yeah, that's funny. We've gone the wrong way. That's because you've, you've hovered your mouse over yeah. the wrong <laughs> Clicker. You know what you're doing. Yeah. There we go. There we go. There we are. Oh, Marcia. Marcia. <laughs> so let's finish with a patient, another message of hope. This is Marcia. She was 52. She weighed about 100 kilos. She'd been on a high dose of insulin since 2004. Um, for her, for Marcia, diabetes is a chronic deteriorating condition and life's a struggle. There's Marcia now. She's transformed. She hasn't needed any insulin for two years. Her blood pressure is sorted out again. She's a well person. Just a reminder, though, if I'm not giving medical advice to any of you, if you're on prescribed medication for type 2 diabetes, you can't necessarily just go low carb without discussing it with your doctor because your medication may need to be changed. And that's the end. So for most patients, the cause of type 2 diabetes is what they have eaten. We have eaten our way into this epidemic of obesity and type 2 diabetes. I believe we can eat our way out again. And um, I think, particularly as we're talking to farmers, do you know the quality and type of food you grow makes such a massive difference? Don't forget to subscribe and also to hit that little bell icon to make sure you're informed and get to counter some of the more corporate style science that's out there. So all the links are in the description box below and also really appreciate all my PayPal and Patreon supporters and anyone else who can continue to support me to provide all the material that I do. It's highly appreciated. So thank you.